I'm conscious as I look at this address again that I've prepared that uh, to some of you it will seem like not so long ago and to others it will seem like ancient history. Um, but what I've tried to do is to mesh my experience uh, through my career with uh, a way of looking at the atmosphere. And I've taken the theme of one atmosphere because I think that uh, it is looking at the atmosphere in totality, both scientifically, but also practically and politically, is actually the right way to look at it. Um, we all experience weather locally, but actually it's the, it's the whole atmosphere that ultimately affects us. Oh, right. Um, I was going to ask, why are we here? I don't mean that in a philosophical sense, but in a sense, why are we interested in this uh, subject? Why are we members of the Royal Met Soccer or coming to a Royal Met Soccer AGM? And I suppose we all, one way or the other, have a, an interest in weather and climate. And it's something which does capture people's interest in many different ways. Uh, it's, it can be quite dramatic. Uh, there's uh, extreme events are almost things that people talk about, whether it be a flood or a snowstorm, the beast from the east, or some drought like 1976, or even last year, which was a pretty uh, dry year as well and hot, um, or it might be a storm. All these things lodge in people's minds. And for some of us, it's more than just a, a passing thing. It's something that sparks our deep interest. And in fact, it was an extreme event that got me interested in meteorology. Um, I grew up in the Glasgow area, and in 1968, January, there was a very extreme storm which hit uh, most of central Scotland, bits of northern England as well. In fact, reading about it now, uh, people reckon it's probably a kind of storm of the century kind of uh, storm. It's probably not that well known in the south, actually. But it was, in fact, a very intense uh, January storm. And I was, what, 14 at the time, so you can do the sums. And uh, I was just a, a young lad. And I think hitherto, I hadn't really shown much interest in the weather, other than, to, other than when it was snowing, and I could go out and sledge, or if it was raining, and I couldn't go out. Um, the storm uh, formed off the east coast of the States shot across the Atlantic very quickly, uh, came into the UK uh, as a left exit, rapidly developing feature. Um, and I think the low pressure in Stornoway was on a record low at 950 millibars. So it was a really intense depression. Anyway, on the southern side of it, we had a storm to hurricane force winds. Um, there was gusts over 100 miles an hour quite widely, and the largest gust was 134 miles an hour at Great Dunfell. Uh, 21 people died as a result of that storm that night. Uh, about 100 were seriously injured, and about 1,800 were made homeless. Um, there was a lot of damage to shipyard cranes, electricity pylons, church spires, and school roofs, and it ripped the glass from the the big greenhouses in the upper Clyde Valley, which supplied Glasgow and the surrounding area with its tomatoes. So there was a dearth of tomatoes, I guess, for quite a wee while. 4% um, of Scotland's commercial forests, equivalent to 18 months timber production, got flattened, and a quarter of a million homes were damaged, more than 1,300 uh, beyond repair. And in fact, our own house was damaged, which obviously made it much more personal to me. A uh, chimney was blown over and came through the roof, but fortunately landed in the, got stuck in the rafters. Otherwise, I probably wouldn't be here today talking to you about it. So that storm really got me interested in weather. And I wanted to understand what causes these things. Why did this happen? And uh, I started to read lots and lots of books on weather and climate. And this is one of my favorite ones. This is an ancient book, Time Life, Time, uh, sorry, Life Science Library uh, from Time, 1966. Um, price, 35 shillings, just to give you a bit of historical context. Um, and I guess this book was one of my favorites because it, uh, it gave an overall view of the weather as part of a global system. 
So it wasn't, I mean, I read plenty of books about clouds and about fronts and about local weather, but this set it all in a much more global context, and that has stayed with me uh, ever since. It was illustrated very well. It was written in a very lively but relevant and scientific way. Uh, there were no equations, so that made it easier to read. And um, it was written from a US perspective, but that didn't really matter. Now, in the preface, Thomas Malone from the US National Academy of Sciences wrote, anyone who reads the pages that follow can scarcely miss the air of excitement, the joy of discovery, and the conviction of accomplishment that permeate the field of meteorology today. So I was hooked, <laughs> and that was me. And here I am still, actually. Um, just going to see if I can. Oh, sorry, that's not what I'm supposed to do. Yeah, OK. Anyway, I, I read other books, of course, uh, more mathematical, more physics orientated. Um, this is a bit personal, but I, I got sufficiently interested that I eventually uh, started uh, subscribing to weather probably in about 1969, so maybe just about a year later. And I decided at that time that I actually I'd quite like to become a weather forecaster. And my father and I went in to see Glasgow Weather Centre and asked what I needed to study. And they said, oh, maths and physics. So I enjoyed doing maths and physics, so that was fine, and that's what I did. Um, so it's a bit strange, looking back, to see that one event could have, you know, an effect on the course of one's career, but that's, that's how it was for me. Okay, so I then got interested in the weather and all its manifestations, but also this business of the global uh, circulation and the interconnectedness of the atmosphere. This picture, I, I'm sure some of you know where I'm going to go with this. This is the, the so-called butterfly effect. So I've got a nice picture of a, a blue morpho, which uh, was actually taken at Wisley, not in Brazil, but, um, uh, and, and a hurricane, well, I'm not sure which one, but anyway, it's uh, one, of the early, in the, one of the earlier studies of numerical modeling, Lorenz, uh, did an experiment where he was uh, looking at how his model was performed, and he wanted to go back and see if he could repeat it. And when he did that, he, set, he put in the initial data by hand and he truncated it. So he rounded it to like three decimal places instead of six. And the net result was that when he ran the model again, it was nothing like the initial run that he'd done. And he thought there was something wrong with the valves, valves, not transistors, guys, <laughs> valves of the model. And it's only after a lot of thinking that we realized that what was happening was that the, even that small rounding actually had such a big impact on the evolution of the atmosphere that was being generated by the computer that it diverged very quickly. I think it was like doubling in error every four days. And of course, that then got people thinking about the, the initial condition problem and the, how even small changes can have a big impact in the evolution of a system like the, the Earth's atmosphere. And, and this was then talked about as uh, sort of colorfully as the butterfly effect. I think he actually referred to a butterfly flapping its wings in Brazil, causing a tornado in Texas. But it's the same, it's the same idea. Now, of course, there are millions of butterflies, and they're all flapping their wings, and there aren't millions of tornadoes or hurricanes. So the point is, is that these small changes don't actually cause the hurricane, but they change the atmosphere in a way in which the hurricane can form. And that is the, the complexity of uh, our, our atmosphere, that the small errors can grow. And of course, this has tremendous ramifications for our ability to forecast the weather, because um, forecasting the weather is primarily an initial value problem. If we knew the, but even if we knew it exactly, Obviously, our models wouldn't necessarily be up to forecasting it correctly. But not knowing the initial value means that errors can grow. And in fact, the ensemble forecasting approach to weather forecasting recognizes this very point. By perturbing the initial conditions, you can see how sensitive the system is to these initial conditions. 
and to whether um, in a particular circumstance it's more stable in a particular direction or not. So that's the first part of my theme, that if we are thinking about one atmosphere, we have to think about the totality of the atmosphere. And it's important to have data coming from everywhere as to provide initial conditions. But it does mean that the growth of errors probably limits this kind of forecasting to something like 10 to 14 days. Um, I was quite keen to do forecasting. I, when I joined the Met Office at first, uh, I did research on observational systems and then hydrometeorology. But eventually, after badgering them a bit, they sent me for a two-week, uh, sorry, two-week, two-year um, secondment to RAF Strike Command. Now, as luck would have it, the day I started was uh, the day after the Easter Bank holiday in 1982. And that very day, Mrs. Thatcher had decided she was going to send a task force to take back the Falkland Islands from Argentina, because they had been invaded uh, about a month before. And I was just arriving at a defense forecasting office, suddenly thrown into the question, well, how do we start providing forecasts for the South Atlantic? And uh, to cut a long story short, one of the things that happened then was that the Met Office, which has already been working on a global model, because at that time, routinely for forecasts, they just used a hemispheric model of 10 levels called the octagon. Um, they obviously needed a, a global model for the South Atlantic, as well as improving forecasts in the Northern Hemisphere as well. And that was brought into operational mode extremely quickly. It was already there, it was a research tool, but it wasn't being run operationally. And it just goes to show how when circumstances really demand it, like a, an emergency of this nature, then you can pull out all the stops and do something like that. Now, the, the new model had 15 levels, and uh, I understand that there was a cell set up in Bracknell to actually look at the data from our ships very securely so that they could have data fed in, because of course there was no data from Argentina, and there's not much data down in the Southern Hemisphere anyway. And the other important thing is we had very good uh, weather satellite information from the US Defense Met Satellite. Now this picture here is one of the early uh, runs of the global model. And uh, I, I, there's a, there's an, it comes from an article on the, the Met Office website, actually, which is worth reading, just about how they developed the uh, numerical modeling at the Met Office. And I think that's probably a, the, what was achievable at the time with the, the computers that they had, with the model that they had, but brought on very quickly by uh, uh, um, an act of war. So uh, global modeling, global forecasting, the importance of global data, all in the sense of one atmosphere. Now, of course, you can think about things spatially. Um, and of course, there's the vertical as well. I think the new model also included the stratosphere, which was become, we now know is very important for forecasting uh, our, our weather. Um, there is the question of climate, which you know, is really weather over a long period of time and uh, its overall effect. And I, I went back to the formation of the society, which was in uh, 1850. I don't know if that's in the quiz, but uh, 1850, uh, 3rd of April. And this is the library at Hartwell House near Aylesbury, which is where they had their first meeting. Now, Hartwell House is now a posh establishment run by the National Trust. So you can stay there if you're feeling uh, like uh, living the high life, I suppose. Um, the key thing was that the, the society, when it was started, recognized that it was going to be about weather and climate. And I think that's actually very important for us. Um, and climate is not just about statistics, uh, for which a lot of people think it is. Climate is about understanding the dynamics of the atmosphere on a longer time scale. The energy balances, the way in which water uh, is moved around in the hydrological cycle, 
the, the role of the boundary conditions like ice and the oceans and the land and the, the constituents of the atmosphere, how they affect the climate. So climate has always been part of the society's remit and I think we've had a renewed emphasis on climate and climate change now, um, which I think is to be welcomed and something which you wrote, you know, has come through in the talk that, that Liz gave. And I'm very keen that we don't forget our weather roots. Weather is extremely important for the society, but also we draw attention to uh, the, the, the climate issue. Um, so we do quite a lot. Um, briefing papers, statements, uh, for example, communique ahead of the Paris uh, meeting on climate change in 2015. Uh, lots of presentations, particular meetings. We had one earlier in January, which was very well attended on the 1.5 degree target. Um, lots of publications and we provide advice. And there's various groups which are do much more on climate. There's communication group, special interest group, and the education group. But in fact, I, I would say that the climate finds its way into lots of different aspects of the, the society's work. And I think that's only right. Um, it, does, it does present a challenge, of the, I think, for the society, though. Um, this is an attempt to think about all the different aspects that are important when you start, one starts thinking about climate. Um, first of all, there's the climate system itself, the atmosphere, uh, as a global entity, and that's where our expertise lies and our interests, of course. Um, very closely aligned to that, there's a whole lot of other geophysical disciplines which are important. Um, hydrometeorology, uh, oceanography, geology, etc. Um, and then there's the impact of the climate on the environment and vice versa, the impact of the environment on the climate. Then there's impacts on society and the impact of society on the climate. And then there's the impact of the policy community working on uh, trying to limit the impacts of uh, human activities on the climate system. Now, it's clear that we can never, as a society, be experts in all these areas. And so it's actually extremely important that we partner ourselves with others who are experts, perhaps in energy systems or whatever. And I think this gives us a tremendous opportunity, actually, to open up the interest and the relevance of the society to others by working on climate and linking with lots of other groups of people. And, and I think we have been doing that increasingly, and I think that needs to continue. It's a very open approach to the work of the society. Um, because I worked in climate change for quite a long time, I thought I'd better say something about climate change. Um, the Keeling curve, uh, named after uh, Keeling, who actually started the observations at Hawaii, shows the ongoing and relentless up uh, increase in carbon dioxide, uh, which was probably around 280 parts per million before the Industrial Revolution, and is now well over 400, and still rising, actually. And there's little doubt that this is due to the burning of fossil fuels and land use change. It's largely driven by human activities. Um, it just goes to show that starting just it's good to monitor things like the, uh, the, the environment, and then you begin to see things that are actually happening. I don't, don't know if Keeling started his work with a view to understanding the greenhouse effect per se, but it was obviously clearly of interest to see that uh, CO2 was increasing. Now, the IGY of 5750 had another big legacy other than this, and that was the um, development of satellites and the exchanging of data more widely from satellites. And so it's actually a very important uh, um, process. Um, you've all seen probably the, the temperature curve. This is from the, the Met Office uh, going up to 2017, showing the relentless rise in temperature, albeit with interannual fluctuations, and very closely aligned to the rise in greenhouse gases, despite the fact that some people would rather have it otherwise. The global temperature warming of one degree doesn't sound much, but actually it is a significant change. When you consider between 
Now, in the last ice age, the temperature difference globally, on average, was probably about five degrees. So you begin to see it as a, a significant um, uh, number. Of course, this has great implications, not just for temperature, but for atmospheric circulation, for extreme events, for um, the hydrological cycle, and of course, all the things that are affected by these. And of course, sea level rise as well, which I should have mentioned. Now, this is a complicated diagram from the IPCC's uh, fifth assessment report. And what it is, it shows, and you don't have to read all the, the details, uh, but what, what I wanted to show was that um, there's a lot of things that are affecting the climate system uh, other than greenhouse gases, to some degree or other. So at the, at the top uh, four bars, we have the radiator forcing. That's the extra energy coming in at the top of the atmosphere, or the less energy going out in a way, um, which is warming the planet. And so we have a large chunk from CO2. We have quite a bit from methane and then halocarbons and nitrous oxide. These are the, the main groups of greenhouse gases. But under that, we also have small changes uh, globally from pollutants like carbon monoxide, vol uh, volatile organic compounds, and NOx, all of which are sort of related to uh, the pollution that's been very much in the news uh, in the last few weeks. And the uh, other aspect of this has been the generation of aerosols, partly from emissions of NOx and sulfur, but also from ammonia, from farming and so on. And we see that this has got a potentially a big, large negative impact as well as a positive one. And it can also have an indirect effect on cloudiness, again, giving a negative impact. So the climate change that we're getting is to some extent a balance between the forcing of greenhouse gases, which are long term, uh, and will be in the atmosphere for hundreds of years, and the short-term effect of aerosols and other pollutants, which could be removed, but which are actually acting in a negative way. Now, on a global scale, the effect is noticeable, but perhaps not so big. On a regional scale, where pollution is very intense, uh, that is actually quite a significant issue. And there is the so-called Asian brown cloud, I think it's now called the atmospheric brown cloud, but anyway, uh, affecting India and China. Um, it's been observed that the, the surface uh, radiation from the sun has reduced by about 10%, um, and that perhaps the overall warming compared to the global average has been dropped by about 50%. So there are regions of the world where air pollution has actually had quite a dramatic impact on the local climate, uh, if not the global climate. And this probably has a negative impact on rainfall in the region as well. So this takes me to a more general point, again, going back to one atmosphere. We're used to thinking of greenhouse gases as a global issue, but I think air pollution also is a global issue, even if it's most intense at the local and regional level. And of course, um, this means that one of the key issues about greenhouse gases and air pollution is that it's not just the people who are emitting these things that are affected, it's going far beyond their borders and affecting those who may be emitting very little. And this is one of the, the big challenges of the current uh, situation. Um, I worked for 20-odd um, years on the Framework Convention on Climate Change. The aim of the convention is to stabilize greenhouse gases in the atmosphere at a level that prevents dangerous anthropogenic climate change, which is a, a good way of stating an aim, but it's quite tricky because there's no definition of what dangerous actually means. And in fact, it's taken the convention a good 20 odd years to get to a view as to what is dangerous. And the IPCC um, has assessed a lot of the projections of climate change and the impacts of stabilization at different levels of greenhouse gases. But contrary to what you might read in the press, the scientific community and the IPCC has never proposed a particular level because that is not a scientific question per se. Science can advise it, it can inform it, but actually it is actually at the end of the day a political 
social question. And um, probably around the time of the Kyoto Protocol, the EU proposed that uh, temperatures should not rise more than two degrees above the pre-industrial level. And that was kicked around for a long time. Very few countries picked this up other than the EU. But it was the first attempt to say what a dangerous level of climate change might be. At the same time, with the ongoing studies of the IPCC and so on, we got a better idea of what this might actually mean in terms of impact. So we looked at the impacts that would arise from a stabilisation of two relative to ongoing temperatures rising to four or five degrees over the next uh, 100 years. At the bottom, you will see that the IPCC did a special report in 2018. And this is slightly out of sequence, but after the Paris Agreement, when a group of countries proposed that the limit should be 1.5 degrees, the IPCC was asked to prepare a special report saying what is the, really to look at what is the impact of climate change at two as against 1.5, and what would you actually have to do to get there? So in Paris in 2015, um, the two degree target was maintained as the firm limit, but with a view that one should be doing much more to limit the temperature rise to 1.5 degrees. But the, the net effect of all this, either two or 1.5, is that the long term emissions would have to come to net zero. And in Paris, it says the second half of the century. Uh, but uh, last week, the Climate Change Committee proposed that the UK make that 2050 uh, for net, net zero emissions. Uh, and certainly, if we're going to go below one and a half degrees, it has to be in the near term rather than the, the long term. Uh, I have to say, this is not a, a trivial request. This is, means changing the way everything that we do uh, and how we do it uh, in terms of using fossil fuels, the food we eat, the way we travel, and so on, will all be affected by a change of this nature. Now, um, human impacts of the atmosphere, I've mentioned greenhouse gases, I've mentioned aerosols, um, I've mentioned transboundary air pollution, there's also stratospheric ozone, uh, which was a big issue in the 1980s when it was the Ar Antarctic ozone hole was discovered uh, as a result of the, the breakdown of chlorofluorocarbons releasing chlorine into the, the stratosphere and destroying ozone. Uh, the Antarctic ozone hole has been kind of arrested and will slowly heal um, because we have pretty well phased out the emissions of chlorofluorocarbons, apart from some which are still in a existing refrigerators and so on. Uh, but it just illustrates that um, changing the global atmosphere can lead to really quite significant uh, challenges in terms of timing. It's an intergeneral, intergenerational issue to solve it, and climate change is even more so an intergenerational issue. So what I'm really saying here is that not only is we're looking at one atmosphere in terms of pollution, but to put a play on words, we have only one atmosphere, and that's the one that we have to protect. So my final slides, I'll just check my time, I'm doing okay. Um, protection of the atmosphere. As it turns out, there are quite a lot of different uh, international instruments which deal with uh, protection of the atmosphere. So we've mentioned the, the Climate Change Convention with its Kyoto Protocol, the Ozone Convention, Vienna Convention, and the Montreal Protocol. Uh, I should explain, for those of you not used to the UN system, uh, most issues are dealt with in a convention which kind of sets the scene, the context, all the definitional issues, the, the broad picture of what the problem's about, how it needs to be solved. Uh, a protocol is a specific instrument that says we're going to actually do one particular thing, we're going to reduce emissions from this quarter or whatever. So most conventions have protocols, so they go from the general to the more specific. And, and, and in a sense, the, the Paris uh, Agreement of 2015, it's not called a protocol, but it is, in, in a sense, a kind of protocol to the, the convention. Um, one of the early air pollution 
conventions with the UN Economic Commission for Europe, the UNECE, which looked at the whole question of transboundary air pollution. And uh, it has about eight protocols as well for Europe and North America. Uh, one of the famous ones which you might have heard about was the, the Sulphur Protocol, um, when Britain would refuse to reduce its sulphur emissions from power stations by 30%, and it's called the Dirty Man of Europe. Uh, in fact, in the end, Britain uh, ended up uh, removing most of its uh, sulphur emissions uh, as, as attitudes changed to um, protecting industry, to protecting the environment. Um, it's interesting that local air pollution also has uh, standards which have been published by the World Health Organizations, but these are not things you can implement. These are things for governments to pick up or others to say, actually, we're not meeting WHO uh, standards. Then there are peculiarities. There are things that don't belong to individual countries like aircraft and shipping. And ICAO and IMO themselves have rules about emissions from the international transport. I came across uh, a, a treaty called NMOD, which I wasn't aware of, on weather modification. And that actually is a treaty to prevent states using weather modification as a weapon of war. So it's quite an interesting thing to be aware that even as far back as 77, people were thinking about things like that. And then there's the whole question of organic pollutants persisting in the environment, which is not just an atmospheric issue, but water and so on. Uh, so that's another relevant. Now, one of the things that um, everything we've talked about is about removing pollution at source, cutting emissions. Uh, on climate change, because the challenge is so big, some people have proposed what we call a geoengineering solution. And that is, instead of just removing emissions, we actually do something else which counteracts them. Uh, and in fact, um, got this nice picture showing the various ideas that people have for uh, contracting the warming of the planet. Um, two, two main categories, solar radiation management, um, which means that you do something which reflects sunlight, basically, and therefore cools the planet. The trouble with that is, of course, that it there's lots of problems with it, but one problem is it doesn't take away the existing problem. So you, you're committed to more and more uh, of this solar radiation management. And that might include putting aerosols in the stratosphere, mirrors in space, um, painting roofs white, all sorts of things people have suggested. Uh, another one is cloud seeding, where you uh, force cloud, uh, water, uh, salt crystals into the atmosphere to seed clouds perhaps in the Arctic or in the, the um, uh, subtropical areas of low stratocumulus. The other approach is to take CO2 out of the atmosphere. We've put it in, so let's take it back out again um, by growing forests, by capturing it technologically, by uh, making the ocean take up more, by putting iron in the ocean, um, and so on. Now, all these things have got a sort of gee whiz quality to them and they're quite seductive and of interest to people. But my own feeling is that um, they represent a huge challenge, uh, not only in terms of the technologies, but in terms of uh, scale, cost, and the whole question of who actually manages them and how would you negotiate what countries or the world would do on this. It would be really quite a big issue. And you can imagine uh, getting something going which would then have a negative effect somewhere else and there would be questions of liability. Um, it's very interesting that Cambridge has set up a, a new centre, a centre for climate repair, to look at geoengineering. And I think it's right that we do look at it. But I have to say that it's not uh, a, a very viable uh, option at the moment. And in fact, there is a danger that people will say, oh, well, if we can do that, we don't need to reduce our emissions. So there's also games that could be played with that. But the, the key point I was going to make is that geoengineering doesn't have a, a clear um, way for being negotiated at the moment or managed. And that would in itself uh, raise major issues. I don't know where it would go, climate convention possibly, but it's um, 
a new challenge for the, the atmosphere. So that comes to my last slide. Uh, we've got a patchwork of agreements looking at uh, ozone, greenhouse gases, air pollution, possibly geoengineering, which hasn't. How do these all relate to one another? Um, I discovered that the, there is a body under the UN called the International Law Commission, which I've never had any dealings with, I have to say. Um, but after a proposal by a Japanese lawyer, Shinya Murazi, in 2011, they began a review of all the legal instruments for protecting the atmosphere in 2013, with a view to thinking about, do we need a, an overarching law of the atmosphere? Uh, unfortunately, the review ended up with a very uh, limited remit, um, which prevented it looking at liability, the political praise principle, and the principle of precaution and also that it shouldn't interfere with ongoing negotiations like the Climate Change Convention. Well, ahead of the Paris Agreement, I can kind of understand that. The work is going on. It's producing draft guidelines. Um, I don't know how it will finish up or where it will end, but it does seem to me that there is a, a, a just justification for thinking about how all these different ways of protecting the atmosphere actually fit with one another and to make sure that we don't, on the one hand, have gaps, but on the other hand, uh, do things which um, interact negatively against each other. So as far as I can understand at the moment, um, the plan is that not that this will replace multilateral, multilateral agreements like the Climate Convention, but will provide a legal framework which would look at the atmosphere in a, in a holistic view. So in other words, looking at one atmosphere from a, a legal standpoint. So, my conclusions, um, I wanted to get across the idea that the global atmosphere as an entity is important and it's, it's very easy to get interested in only bits of it. But for understanding predicting the weather, we need to take a global view. For understanding climate and the human influence in the atmosphere, we need to take a global view. And for protecting the atmosphere, we need to take a global view. Thank you very much. I'll take one from Mark, please. You can just put your hand up, Mark. So we can... Very nice talk and nice title. Um, so, yeah, I hadn't really appreciated you were talking about nature and um, clouds and it like it has a double effect in a sense, in addition to clouds. But the sort of thing that sort of um, tries to clean up local air quality uh, around the world. I just wonder. A positive story there. I don't know if you could comment on that. Yeah, it's tricky because, um, you know, a lot of countries in Southeast Asia still burn a lot of coal. So the, the big pollutant is sulfur dioxide. Now, we put in sulfur scrubbers in the UK as part of the, the Long Range Transboundary Air Pollution Convention. And as did other countries, and that removed the sulfur, but actually it increases the amount of coal that you have to burn to get the same amount of electricity out. So actually, although you remove the sulfur, you increase your CO2. Um, so ultimately, the only way around that is not to burn coal, uh, which is, of course, where we're headed now in the UK. But in Southeast Asia and China, I think that's... You know, they're probably some way off that, although they're beginning to realise just how serious the, the sulfur pollution problem is. If you've ever visited Beijing or Delhi, uh, you really know they've got a sulfur problem. So it's, uh, But just scrubbing it might be fine for a, a short term, but I think the long term change has to be getting out of coal, particularly. And we've also managed that by moving to gas. So We've improved our efficiency in burning fossil fuels because gas produces less CO2 uh, per unit of power. But at the, at the end of the day, it's still a fossil fuel. So, you know, there are steps along the way. And it's a question of how far 
how many steps that you have to take to get to the sort of zero emission level with renewables or, dare I say, nuclear or something like that. I, I was just wondering, in your opinion, you've obviously had a lot of experience in many international conferences. How realistic is the two degree aim and do you think we'll achieve it? Yes. Um, I've been giving another talk on climate change, actually, and I've faced up to this question directly. I mean, I don't want to be in the, the game of saying whether I think it will happen or not, because, you know, I can't really know. But what I can say is that I can look at what would tend to give you optimism that you could get there and what doesn't. And on an optimistic side, um, if you say, well, the, the problem's now well understood, you can't say that nobody knows about it. Um, there's a growing, at least in uh, Western countries, growing awareness of the problem. Uh, you, can't, you can't make big changes unless the population are behind you. So it's important that people understand the, the issues and recognise that this has to be done. And I think there is a sign that that is beginning to happen. Um, there are tremendous developments in technology taking place that suggest that you can actually reduce emissions by very large amounts. Um, the technology costs of, say, renewable energy have declined much faster than people expected that they would, becoming more efficient as well. So I think there are positive things. There are lots of companies who are, are get the message and they want to you know, in a sense, make money out of the green economy, which is fine. And there are big opportunities in that, and there's opportunities for employment. But on the other hand, it's a big ask. Time is pretty short. Um, the, the noise is coming from across the Atlantic politically are not helpful at the moment, uh, shall I say. Um, the UN system, although it grinds exceedingly small, does grind slowly. Uh, and, you know, there's questions, can it really move things fast enough? Um, I, I also think there, there's still a lot of uh, people with vested interest in burning fossil fuels. And if you look at where you can make your money, it's still in investing in fossil fuels at the moment. So there are big issues. There's a big demand and a growing demand for electricity. And a lot of that will be probably... Um, met by burning gas and oil, even if it's not coal. So um, there is a tension between the new technologies which are coming in, and ultimately my feeling is that they've got to show themselves to be cheaper, better than the fossil fuel technology for it to ultimately work. Um, I always think of digital cameras uh, as a, an example of this. Um, for people <coughs> my age, we all used to use film, uh, but you don't get many people expect a few specialists using film these days. Everybody's gone over to digital. That's because it's, you know, it's got a tremendous uh, opportunity. It's actually cheaper now as well, I think, than the old film cameras. So if a technology is better, it will fly. It's, it's quite hard pushing water uphill, uh, which is what we've been trying to do in the early years of the debate. But at some point, there'll be a tipping point and things will start to go and people will invest much faster in green, the green economy. So that's, that's what I think we are. Um, you know, I don't know if it's doable or not, but we've got to try. Peter. Oh, oh, thank you. Just following on from that, one thing you haven't mentioned, which I guess didn't exist a year ago, was Greta Thunberg's school strikes movement. Um, we've seen the Extinction Rebellion. How do you think this changes the debate? And maybe in what way can we engage with this energy, if you like? Like the Chinese president that was asking what he thought of the French Revolution, he said it was too early to say. And I, I kind of I feel it's a little bit early. Um, it's great that there are people who are now saying, yeah, we've really got to take this seriously and work on it. But my worry is that they might overplay their hand. And by asking for too much too quickly, they will actually provoke a backlash. And that will make it even harder for politicians to do make the changes that need to be made. So it's, it's, it's you know, two cheers, but I, I think people have to be careful. Because 
you know, if you really want to have net zero emissions in the UK by 2030, well, I mean, we're just going to have to absolutely revolutionise everything we do. And I don't think many people will actually be up for that yet. I think one of the interesting questions, by the way, is how does the scientific community and the society engage with uh, the school strike movement and extinction rebellion, you know, in, in a scientific uh, sense? Uh, yes. I think it's an interesting question. Yes, I mean, I think we should engage with as many people as possible, but um, I think we should be prepared to take a, a more measured view, if I can put it that way. I mean, I noticed that the Climate Change Committee in its report says it's unrealistic to think of getting to net zero emissions before 2050. So, you know, you might agree or disagree with them, but that's their considered view. So. I'll take time for one more question before we go to questions. Got one over here, please. Um, I think most of the major countries, developed countries, have accepted that developing countries are not going to be very good co um, contributors to the process of improving the atmospheric situation whilst they're still developing. They're going through their mini industrial revolutions and so on. But leaving that aside, and even leaving the views, say, of Donald Trump aside, it seems to me the biggest problem is that you're not in the end going to make people reduce their standards of living. Um, you know, I can remember my great-grandmother picking me up from the station in her pony and trap, but people won't go back to that. Yeah, you're right, and but I, I don't think it necessarily means that. Um, you know, as I say, if you have a more successful technology, which is clear, then the aim must be to um, continue to improve quality of life, but at the same time do it in a way which is sustainable. And that's the, that's the question. I mean, if you, I mean, I don't know, to me in 100 or 200 years time, people look back and say, you mean you felt it was okay to just combust muck into the atmosphere? I mean, it would just be the same as cigarettes. People used to think it was nothing to smoke in an office, but you don't do it now. Uh, on terms of the um, developing country, developed country issue, that's what Paris was about. In the initial UNFCCC agreement, developed countries were given uh, no targets, just the developed world had targets, albeit relatively minor, actually, in retrospect. Um, but of course, Paris recognised that all have to contribute in one way, recognising there is a development issue, but but at the end, at the same time, all countries will have to contribute. And developing countries are at all very different stages. Uh, a country like China is almost in the same level now as Europe in terms of its emissions. Whereas uh, perhaps uh, some poor countries in Africa or Southeast Asia are still very much in the developing mode, but actually are not emitting very much as well. And, and the thing that we ought to try and for is that they jump from where they are now to a more developed status without going through a dirty phase, if I can put it that way. Okay, thank you. Can you join me in just thanking David for a very stimulating talk? <laughs>